What's up, y'all? I'm Britton, one of the pastors here, and we're so glad that you decided to join us uh, viewing this sermon online. We hope that this sermon can be a resource to you and a blessing, but never a replacement for what God is doing through a local church body. So if you're tuning into this and uh, maybe you live within the context of our church here in Buckley or in Manistee, we'd love for you to join us sometime in person. Um, and maybe you're watching this and you don't live within the context of the tabernacle in northern Michigan. We'd love for you to find a local church to plug into that you can be a part of what God's doing there. So thanks so much. Enjoy. To Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Hello, Tabernacle. How's everybody this morning? I want to hear from each and every one of you. How are you? Good. You're awake. Um, you're alive. If you're expecting something as good as the music that just happened, you're going to be vastly disappointed. That was fantastic, wasn't it? Just incredible. Uh, no excuse. Even if you did not enjoy caffeine today, um, you're awake. I want to point out something special that happened during that. Um, and I'm, I think I want your participation in this a little bit. Uh, I don't know if we're going to do an online poll or maybe a text number or something, but uh, that was Adam, our student ministries pastor, uh, up here. Did you catch that? I mean, he's like, yeah, he was awesome. It's like I didn't know that guy could sing. I seem to be ringing just a little bit. I don't know if it's a little loud. There we go. Uh, but I'm thinking we take a poll and see if Britain gets up here. <laughs> so... Uh, we're going to do it this way. We're going to keep it simple. Um, by a show of hands, that those of you that would like to see Britain come up and lead in worship, raise your hands. Uh, that was every single person here. Let me check Manistee. I'm looking. I got a camera. Thank you, Manistee as well. They all raised their hands. So, Britain, you're going to be up, uh, and he's off somewhere, and he doesn't know it, but we're going to make him do it. So, we're in Titus. Uh, two today were verses one through eight, and Titus is a young preacher in the Isle of Crete. And Crete is, uh, it's not a backwards nation, um, but they've been off on their own in this little island. They, they're set in their ways, uh, and the, it, it has not been a godly place. It's kind of been sin city throughout the course of their history. Um, they've been, uh, had a lot of different people move in over time, and, and Greece is there now. There's a lot of Grecian policies happening in that city and culture, uh, and uh, we're going to take a look at what, what happens. So in, in Second Titus, Titus 2, not 2nd, there's only one of those, he gives this stern warning. And, and I love it because we're on the heels of last week being taught there's false teachers and preachers and they're going to be everywhere and they're going to be putting out words and, and be very careful of that. And as he finishes that, he jumps to the next chapter and he opens with these words to Titus. And he says, but as for you, and I stopped and I paused and I went, you know, I, I went like right over it and then I went back and went, wait a minute. But as for you, what, what type of a tone is that that he's setting? And I was thinking, well, if, if my dad, God rest his soul, said to me, but as for you, there ain't no lip coming back from this guy, right? It's kind of like, a, a, it, it's a command. It's almost a military type of a, of a statement. And he's, he's being emphatic about it because he says, there needs to be a difference in your teaching. It needs to be authentic and true and real and faithful to Scripture. But as for you, you're going to teach sound doctrine. So in today's world, that's not an easy thing to do. There's a lot of noise out there, and the noise is sometimes sounds good uh, and, and maybe 
it's attractive in some ways, and maybe it's disgusting, and we just want to get angry and hole up in a little shell, and that's not what we're called to do as Christians and as leaders. And so he's writing this letter to Titus, uh, and that lets everybody else off the hook, right? Because it's just to Titus, but in reality, we extrapolate just a little bit, and he's saying to families, to mothers, to fathers, to siblings, to children, to grandchildren, regardless, you have a position of authority somewhere. And this is saying, but as for you, so the responsibility doesn't all lie here, it lies here. Two things I've learned about ministry, if you're ever going to go into ministry, and those of you that are in ministry now, this is some valuable words, and, and it's what my experience has been. When you're given a position, whatever that position is, and you feel God has called you and led you to that position, always hold that position in ministry loosely like this. Because he may have a different plan for you. He may have someone that's better than you to take your place. He may want you just for a short while. And if we hold it loosely like this and the next person comes in, it's an easy transfer. And we can go on doing what God wants us to do outside of ministry. And if we hold it like this, then our identity is created in what we do. And this thing called pride and sin because to come in and the thought of if it's an empty congregation, I'm no good. But if it's really full and loud, then, then I'm good. And That's from the pit of hell. That's false teaching. But when it comes to doctrine, when it comes to what Scripture truly says, we hold it like this, firmly. We have accountability. We double-check Scripture. We're willing to take rebukes if we're wrong. We're willing to preach hard If the spirit desires, we hold on to doctrine incredibly tightly because if we don't, it all goes away and we become false teachers. So he says, but as for you, you will teach in accord what is sound doctrine. So what is doctrine? Doctrine is very simply, if you were to take the Bible and read it and you need to give a one paragraph statement, what what is it about? What's the essence of it? And the essence of it is God is good and God created us and we fell in sin and he needs to interrupt. He's got a plan in the Old Testament is here's the life and everything is pointing to Jesus and there's beauty and mistakes and horrific events and gorgeous events and miracles all the way through. And we get to the New Testament and Jesus is born and that's his plan to get us back. And Jesus lives his life and ministers and he performs miracles. And like the song said, he's not going to run out of them. It's not a limited amount of miracles. And he performs those miracles and he lives a sinless life. And he's pointing to his heavenly father the entire time. And then he goes to the cross unjustly. And in a literal sense, he takes all of the sin of the world upon himself because he was blameless and he was crucified, he died in a horrible manner, and he was buried, and he rose again on the third day, alive. He defeated Satan's sin and death. That was the payment he made for us, for you, for we. And he ascended into heaven, and he promised us one day he's coming back. And in the meantime, he sent the Holy Spirit And the Holy Spirit is invited in and dwells within believers and empowers and encourages and opens our eyes to Scripture and to the world around us, in particular individuals that we can see and we can love. That's sound doctrine. There's a lot of small things in there as well. We call those small rocks. Baptism is a big rock, which we're going to celebrate how you get baptized is a small rock. So sound doctrine, we don't want to spend our time arguing about small rocks. In fact, we don't want to argue about anything. We want to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's sound doctrine. 
And you need to know that because God may move you. He may bring you and your family to a new location and you need to find another church. Britain might come up and sing and destroy your eardrums and you have to leave. I have a feeling that guy can sing too for some reason. They're just so talented. If you do leave and you go to another church, make sure it is filled with sound doctrine. We're not the church for everyone. So let's get into the word. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children. They are to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. I wonder how many of you I just lost right there. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity and dignity and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. So sound doctrine, why do we need sound doctrine? Because uh, we live in a very sinful world and it's really crazy right now and it may be the craziest time ever, but it's not because history repeats itself. There's nothing new under the sun, that says Ecclesiastes. That means that even in our evil ways, even in sin filled around us, there's nothing new. And our reactions or our responses to that as believers, there's nothing new. So part of that is like, calm down, this isn't over. We have the end of the book. But in the meantime, there's this thing that's happening in our society that is questioning, which I believe is good to a point, what Scripture says. We should test it. But the questioning isn't in an honest way. It's in a dishonest way. And this dishonest way is to go, I, I want it to say something good about me. I want it to affirm that the lifestyle that I've chosen is just A-OK -okay and that let's, in fact, let's take it so nobody gets to judge anybody over anything. Let's deny that evil is present. Let's deny that there's influence all around us. And sometimes we'll hear something so many times and it's repeated so many times that we begin to question our own sanity and our own values and our own morals which have come from Scripture. We are built in the image of God, both man and woman, and there's something innate in us that knows Little kids demonstrate this to us. They can tell. There, there's times when their radar is really big and they can sense danger and, and they'll come back to us. And, and as adults, sometimes we beat that out of ourselves and that's not okay. We need to not beat that out of ourselves. We need, we need to pray and be attentive. But sometimes we'll hear it so often that we'll start to question, maybe I'm wrong. Well, I know I'm fallible and I've been wrong at least once a day. So I can question, but scripture is inerrant and it doesn't change and it's sound and it will point us in the right direction. I watched a movie recently and it was about the classic good and evil. And there is evil is sitting on one side of the table represented as a man in jail. And good is a, a psychiatrist who's evaluating him on the other side, and he's amoral, he's agnostic, he doesn't really have a faith, he's heard of some of it, but, you know, he's kind of moved on, he's progressive. And in the course of this conversation, all of a sudden, evil leans forward on this table. He says, Jimmy, 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 you're losing the battle. And Jim... James, as he prefers to be known, on the other side leans back and goes, huh, in almost a smug way, I didn't know we were fighting. 
And evil leans forward and says, that's why you're losing the battle. Because they forgot sound doctrine. So it says, as for you. And there's a reason why it says, as for you. It's because Paul has been around the block. And he's seen it all. He's been to big cities, little cities. He's been to everything in between. He's been in the desert. He's been in the mountains. He's been on lakes. He's seen all types of people, all different colors of people, and all different excuses and reasons. He's seen all different lifestyles. He's been to Rome. He's been to Galilee. And now he's writing to Crete. And he writes in 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, this warning. And it's to Timothy, but it's for Titus. And it's for all of the teachers and preachers at the tabernacle. And it's for all of the congregants who attend. And he says, for the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths or falsehoods. Do you see it in our world today? Can, can, can you just taste it? And we're going to leave here where we commune together as a congregation and we worship a holy God. And we're going to go out and the influences will be around us. And something, the spirit, our belief, our faith, the miracles that we witness, the hope that we carry in the gospels is the thing that's going to carry us through. And that's called sound doctrine. What our itching ears want to hear. I was talking with a, a, another person who counsels and the position that that person is in right now is really good. And he, says, he said this, he said, it's really interesting because it's the first time in my life and he's a little bit older that I've had a whole bunch of people who want to change and are willing to do the work. And I love it. When counsel happens, which is what this is, you have a choice. Do you want something beautiful to happen? Or is the fear and the pain and the frustration of what your itching ears want to hear? Because what we want to hear is, I'm okay, just the way I am. Now, if you follow Jesus, if you've asked him into your life, and you're struggling, he loves you just the way you are. But he doesn't want you to stay there. His desire is to move forward. And when we deny, we're susceptible to false teaching. And the false teaching rarely comes from the pulpit. It comes from life. So he gives us some instructions. And he gives instructions to older men. So I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. Are you guys with me on that? Older men. How many of you consider yourself older men? Okay, yeah. Wait, you're older. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I, I guess I fall into that category in my brain when I wake up. I'm not there. When I look in the mirror, it's like, whoa. I guess I fell into the older man category. So older men. So this is the help. This is how we fight false doctrine. And he's saying, here's some qualities that, that maybe you should or should not have. And he, he begins with this, older men, don't be fat and drunk. Come on, that's funny. <laughs> you know, there was some discussions that I read about is when he says, be sober-minded, you know, well, is he talking about just being rational or is he? No, you know, in the original language, it's don't be drunk. Older men, right? You've been there. You've done that. You had enough. This isn't about whether or not you can drink alcohol. You can. It's fine. But don't overindulge. And an older, man, an older man should have learned that by now. And then suddenly you find yourself and you're retired. What am I going to do? I'm going to go to a beach in Florida every winter. And yeah, I don't see that as scriptural. But well, if that's what you do, you do. Sorry. I usually get yelled at by somebody. 
retired who goes to Florida. Bless you. But, as, you know, we don't have the work anymore, and we get a little gluttonous, and our bodies begin to change, and we're not, you know, uh, digesting as quickly, and so it shows. And, it, you know, so, so a fat, drunk man, who's going to listen to that? Who's going to listen to that? I mean, after a while, even the dog goes away. An older man is to understand what sound doctrine is. He should be able to, in his own words, if he's a believer in Christ and a member of the church, an older man should be able to give a simple little explanation of what sound doctrine is. Not to confuse or to show off or to quote a billion pieces of scripture, but to go, this is what my heart says sound doctrine is because Jesus changed my heart and I lived by his word. Older men are to act their age to be mature. And that just like, oh, yeah, that's not a big deal. Yeah, it is, because I've worked with a lot of older men who are very immature. Oh, I just heard a woman go, "Mm -hmm." (laughs) mm-hmm. There are times just because you're older, that does not mean you're mature. And I've watched the way some of us older men have responded to something that has hurt us. And it's not mature. It says here that you're supposed to love those around you always. You're supposed to be able to show love always. It doesn't mean you always bring a card and flowers. That's not it. It's you're showing love to those around you so so that it's attractional, so that your love is genuine, that you actually care about people, that, that you've got time. Older men are to show that because it's an example. An older man should have very deep roots. He's a bigger tree now. And his roots mean that when adversity comes, he doesn't fall over. That his faith isn't just second nature, it's first nature. And that in the midst of the storm, those that tremble around him can look and go, he's calm, I can can hold on to this. He'll help me through. And by the grace of God, Older men, you will. I think he's saying, older men, be a child of God and let it show. I gave it to the older men, didn't I? Older women, you're fine. (laughs) Uh, See nothing at all. I'm actually scared of older women. I don't know if you can tell. I don't know if my body language is showing anything right now. Uh, Teachers and preachers are to not be afraid to proclaim the gospel. It says this about older women. Treat those around you with respect and do not gossip. Now, men gossip as well, okay? It's not in there, but I think there's more power when women gossip. I think that it's sharper and harsher and crueler. And I think that it breaks not just hearts but souls. It breaks wills. And it's evil. And it says, do not do that. You're to show respect. Does that mean that men don't have to show respect? No, it doesn't. It means that God has put you in a position where your respect will have more power to those around you than any man could ever give. And it says this, don't be fat and drunk. It does. Don't drink too much wine. Don't be gluttonous. How come that's not funny? I think it's hilarious, honestly. It, that seems relatively simple. But it says that you're, you're, you're to teach those around you what is good and what love is. What better place to learn what love is? Do you know how many songs there are about love that totally miss the mark? I mean, there's a billion number one hit love songs that just are stupid. I mean, they are. It's a catchy tune, and we love to say it. And then all of a sudden, you realize what you're saying out loud as you're singing along in your shower, and you go, I'm an idiot. I should have listened to the older woman who's showing me what this love is. It's consistent. 
and it's helpful, and it has a discipline, and it's not reckless or careless. It's measured out in good portions to those around that person, and you've been given that gift, women. Do that. Specifically, teach young women how to be wives and mothers. I don't know if any of you women have ever had a baby, but if you had a baby when you got home and it was your first one, did you know everything? No, you don't know everything. And then as you're raising them and they start to be toddlers and then, you know, they get to that point and you're like, man, I made it through the day without murdering anyone. I'm a good mom, right? Well, there's older women who've been there that would love to teach an older man and older women. The time to teach is when somebody asks, not when you think they need it. That was for free. Show them what it's like to be peaceful. Teach what submission looks like with a godly, mutually submitting husband. Be pure, pure in heart and pure in knowledge of Christ's redemption. Be God's daughter. Older women, can you be God's daughter for a minute? There's an implication of letting go of control. And there's an implication of resting in his love and his protection. Now, we live in a world that's got a lot of sharp corners and sin and pain. And the word submission turns so many people off. We think of MMA, the ultimate fighting, and submission means you lose. It means that if you don't submit, the guy's going to break your neck or your arm, and you're going to be in a world of hurt, and so you submit saying, you're better than me. And we like to bring that into the church, but that's not what it means. And I I would really like us to be able to understand this, and, and we've preached on it several times, and I've done podcasts on it, but... This older women teaching younger women thing, when when I got married to my wife, and I told this story without her permission last night, and then I got permission after the fact. So she lived out in Arizona, and, you know, that was back in the time when, when like, you'd make a, a phone call, and it would ruin your bill if you made it across the states. It was very expensive. We used to have these things called calling cards where you had to put in 7,000 digits and get them all correct before. Yeah, so it was expensive. There wasn't a lot of communication, and travel was different back then. It was horse and buggies. But so we're way out west, and my parents had never met my wife or her family. They talked to her on the phone. And my dad was a pastor, and he flies out, and they're going to marry. My dad's going to do the wedding. And so we sit down at a little table out by the pool, like you do in Arizona. Uh, and, you know, my wife says, hi, I'm Heidi. And my dad gives her a hug and stuff. Uh, and then we sit down to plan the wedding, and my wife goes, that submission thing won't be in there. All right? And my dad being as gracious, and, and I'm like, cool, I don't want that either. You know, I, I was a pagan at that point, but... Uh, My dad graciously said, okay, we'll leave that out. Because it would have started a weird family fight, right, right in the beginning. My dad was wise. And my wife does not feel proud of that today. And through the course of her growing up and maturing and finding Jesus, she was able to have women surround her that understood what Submission meant, and it doesn't mean you're a patsy and that you never have a voice and that you get treated like a second-class citizen. It means that there's going to be this, I I have your best interest at heart. I'm your advocate, and I will always be your advocate. I will be your advocate in good and in bad. And I didn't know it, but she was subtly teaching me about what submission was. She got it way, way, way before I did. Because I always thought submission was the beer me woman movement, which I was a silent fan of to my detriment. And if it wouldn't have been for older women, and if it wouldn't have been for older men in my life, 
who God subtly put in different places and they were able to speak to me and they all pointed me to Jesus and, you know, and, and, until the revelation happened and then I decided I wanted this submissive life as well where we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That I hold her as God's daughter and she holds me as God's son. That's what submission is about. So I don't know if that can take away any fear for any women. Some women have a real reason to fear and I'm sorry for that. But I know that the spirit can help you overcome. And if you have a godly man, he will help you overcome. And then it goes on to younger women. Younger women are an enigma. I avoid them at all costs. It's because I have nothing, really. I mean, I've never been a woman. I don't know what it's like to be a younger woman. Um, you know, I, I have some spiritual advice, and I, I, I have some pastoral advice, but I've never been there. And I think what this bit of scripture is saying for younger women is um, be responsible by being teachable. Can you take a minute and remember that there are those who desire to help you and, and they love you and they're not going to shame you and it really is okay, younger women, that you don't know everything yet. It's really okay. But you do have the power to be teachable. Seek advice from godly women who have been there, done that, come out on the other side that are peaceful. Not every older woman or older man is going to be the one you want to seek. And one of the keys for us seeking is are they peaceful? Do they have a peace that passes understanding? Not are they perfect, but do they have something that's desirable in their character? And then it goes to younger men. Younger men, buckle up. Okay, Manistee, is anybody alive over there? I mean, after this music we had. Younger men, you're no longer a child. You're not a kid anymore. It's time to grow up. You grow up, but you become puffed up as a younger man. Stop being puffed up. In fact, I'm going to summarize it in just a short little bit that might get me in trouble. Okay? I'm willing to take this risk because I love you. This isn't for shock value. Younger men, don't be an ass. Okay? Don't be an ass. Because those of us from the outside looking in, that's the first word sometimes that comes in when we see your childishness, your selfishness, and your behavior. Just like the, women, the younger women, you need to be responsible by being teachable. These godly men are going to teach you something. And it may not even make sense for the moment. I think back to this time long ago when I was uh, probably about 13 and some reason I was going to start golfing. I'd never golfed. There was nobody in my family that really golfed. My dad golfed some, but he was a hack. He was horrible. I never wanted to play like my dad. Uh, and so I was kind of on my own and this old guy, Mr. Patrick, lived next door to me and he had some clubs and he saw me out there with a club and he came over and... Uh, he talked about how I hold my club, and I had to do it this very specific way, and I could only do it left-handed to begin with. And I didn't understand. It didn't make any sense. It felt really awkward, but he made me do it over and over and over. Uh, and so then I started to play golf and use that technique that he taught me, and it worked. And he came over because he loved golf. He played golf his whole life. And he came over because he saw that I didn't know what I was doing. And he asked if he'd like if I'd like a lesson or two. And I said, yes. And I didn't sit there and tell him, you don't know what you're doing. That's old fashioned. I just listened and it worked. I mean, kind of a private pat on the back. I went out and had it. There was this golf league that I was in and there was the A and the B tiers and I was in B because I was brand new and I won. I had a trophy. And then I was puffed up and I was an ass. <laughs> <laughs> you 
In today's world, we like to call this movement that we have going progressive. That people are progressive. And I'm here to tell you that's a, that, that's a falsehood. See, we progress. How did we progress? Well, we're more tolerant. We're not, we're not racist anymore. We don't judge anymore. Every lifestyle is acceptable. We can have weird things happen in our schools, and that we just need to be okay with that. And, and teachers and preachers can begin to change the meaning of the words of Scripture to fit their own itching ears, and we're to be okay with that. And, and we really love the, with this ego that we have to question, did God really say? And the answer is definitively, I don't think so, but I think this. And we elevate ourselves to this position of God with a little G. And we think that if we just follow these steps, everything's going to fall into line, and that's a fairy tale. Jesus Christ is not progressive. Let me say that again. If you leave here with one thing today, Jesus Christ is not progressive. He's not enlightened. He's not tolerant. Now, he loves all and he lets all make their decisions. In John 6, it tells us that all of these disciples were around and a group of them were going, man, what you're teaching is really hard. I don't think we could do this. Who could do what you're asking us to do? And they left, and Jesus let them go. He did not yell at them. He did not call them back. He did not rebuke him. He let them walk. But he was not tolerant in their feelings, and he was not progressive listening to the leaders around him. God is faithful, and he is steadfast, and he never changes. And that should bring out the biggest amen in the planet for us because the world we live in changes really fast, but we should fear not because he tells us not to fear. And one of the things he gives us is sound doctrine. And he also took Crete, and he said, you know what? Let's start the world's, and I don't know if this is true, first small groups Let's have older men meet. Let's have younger men meet with older men. Let's have older women meet. Let's have older women meet with younger women and, and fight clubs and Bible studies and things start growing and it was so much deeper. It was, they were putting down roots so that when they all get old, they're gonna have deep roots. And the storm that comes, they're gonna be the ones we look to. They say, help us with our faith. You've been there, done that, came out the other side peaceful. It's simple, but it's not easy. So the bands are going to come out here and in Manistee. They're going to close us in a worship song, and we worship a holy God. And so I'm going to ask if you'll bow your heads, and we're going to pray our way out. God, thank you for the lessons in Titus and the words through all of Scripture so they can be so encouraging and they can take what seems so complicated and scary and make it so simple. Take away our fear. Help us to mature. Help us to choose to be responsible for the own doctrine that we believe, the doctrine of the gospel, the message of Christ. And we can rest in that. Thank you for making us creatures who need to be in community. We're not to be alone. And we're going to be in the world, Father, and the world is a dangerous place. And evil exists to harm you, to wound you, and we're the easiest target. Father, help us to follow what you've taught us so that we will not make a fool of your bride, the church, and so that we will be strengthened in our witness, Father. Whatever that looks like will be filled with your holy power. Father, God bless this congregation as you continue to expand it. We are witnessing a miracle and the Holy Spirit thrives. Bless you and thank you for that. Amen.
Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else can make every king bow down? Who else can whisper in darkness tremble? such praises what a splendor outshines the sun what a the majesty rules with justice only a holy God come and behold him Consumes like fire. What are the power can raise the dead? What are the name remains undefeated? Only a holy God. Come and be
And all God's people said, amen, amen. Oh my gosh, it is so good to worship and praise his name together. Um, please don't forget, tonight um, we will be in Cadillac. We'll be there. Um, I think these guys are going to be there. A lot of these guys are going to be there. Um, we cannot wait to spend some time with our Cadillac family. So hopefully see you there. Um, don't forget, prayer team are right over there. They'd love to pray with you. Uh, take care. We love you. We'll see you next week or tonight. <laughs>